Welcome to the first installment of Weekly Space News from Ad Astra. I'm Swapna Krishna. Let's talk about what happened this week in space science and spaceflight. Today, I'm going to talk about the latest JWST images, black holes ripping up stars, a gorgeous photo from the International Space Station, astronauts assigned to NASA's Crew-9 mission, and more. If you like what you see, I'd appreciate a like for the video and a subscribe to my channel, Ad Astra. The biggest news of the week is JWST's incredible galaxy survey for FANGS. These 19 spiral galaxy images are helping scientists understand the ins and outs of galaxy formation, evolution, and structure. The big deal here, besides how gorgeous they are, is the incredible detail within these images. JWST is able to resolve individual stars in distant galaxies. That's amazing. NearCam, or JWST's near-infrared camera, is what captured these glowing stars. You can see millions of them in these images, while MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument, showcases dust. In these images, the dust is around and in between the stars. You can peer through the gas and dust, thanks to infrared, and see the red stars, which would normally be blocked by dust if you were looking at them in visible or UV light. These are the young stars that haven't yet emerged from their gas and dust shell. If you want to know more about the survey, check out my video on FANGS and see the comparison between Hubble's and JWST's FANGS photos. In other cosmic news, astronomers at MIT found 18 black holes ripping up stars. When a star is drawn into a black hole, the energy that's released when the black hole finally rips it apart is called a tidal disruption event. It's a huge burst of energy across the electromagnetic spectrum. Astronomers have traditionally looked for these events by pinpointing bursts with specific characteristics in the optical and x-ray bands of light. Up to now, scientists have found about a dozen of these, which means this new discovery more than doubles the tidal disruption events that we have found. Results were published in the Astrophysical Journal. The way these scientists went about identifying these events is pretty unconventional. Instead of just looking for optical and X-ray bursts, scientists searched for infrared radiation from these tidal disruption events. Infrared radiation is especially prone to occur in so-called dusty galaxies. These galaxies have an active galactic nucleus with a supermassive black hole at its center, but there's a lot of material surrounding this nucleus. That's in contrast to our own galaxy, where our central black hole, Sagittarius A star, is relatively dormant because it's not really actively consuming material. What happens is the tidal disruption event actually heats up the surrounding dust and debris, which gives off infrared radiation. And scientists can look for that, a sharp spike in heat resulting from the tidal disruption event, and find yet more of these. What we found is that these events are probably relatively common across the cosmos, and this new method is a reliable way of locating them. In other news this week, scientists found some hidden stars, including some stars that randomly emit puffs of smoke. Scientists have called these stars old smokers, and they're located near the center of our galaxy. During a 10-year survey of this area, scientists noticed that certain red stars showed strange changes in brightness. It turns out that the team had discovered a new kind of red giant star. Red giants are dim stars that have moved off the main sequence, meaning they're nearing the end of their lives. Scientists think that our own sun might one day become a red giant. They're large stars and relatively cool. The 21 stars the team found near the heart of our galaxy sit quietly for years, but then every once in a while they give out puffs of smoke. The question is, why are they doing this? Scientists aren't sure yet, but one clue is where the stars are located. They're in an area of our galaxy called the nuclear disk, the innermost part of the Milky Way. The stars in this area tend to be rich in heavy elements. The team thinks that this might make it easier for dust to condense out of gas on the outer layers of a red giant star. But how this becomes a puff of smoke? That's still a mystery. Closer to home, there is a gorgeous photo you might have seen of the Earth, taken from the International Space Station. The atmosphere is glowing golden. Why is that? This is called air glow. Around 300 miles above the Earth's surface, which is right around where space station orbits. 
you can see red, green, purple, or in this case, gold light. This occurs when atoms and molecules high up in the Earth's atmosphere are excited by ultraviolet light from our sun and emit light called photons to shed that extra energy. The phenomenon is similar to the northern lights, but it's because of normal radiation, not solar wind. Unlike auroras, air glow is really too dim to see from the ground, but the astronauts aboard the International Space Station get a great view of air glow in the ionosphere, which is the Earth's upper atmosphere. Elsewhere in this photo, you can see the ISS about 258 miles above the Earth over the Pacific Ocean. You can also see part of the Russian side of the space station from this photo, a lab module and a docking module as well. This week, NASA also named the astronauts for the next crewed mission to the International Space Station. Crew 9 will launch aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule, and it's scheduled no earlier than August. NASA astronauts Commander Zena Cardman, pilot Nick Haig, and Mission Specialist Stephanie Wilson, as well as Roscosmos Cosmonaut Mission Specialist Alexander Gorbanov, will all be on this flight. The next NASA mission to the ISS, Crew 8, is currently scheduled for no earlier than February 22nd aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft called Endeavour, and that'll be flying for the fifth time. In other ISS news, Boeing's long-delayed Starliner is also still on track for an April launch. That will be the first crewed launch of this very long-delayed spacecraft, and will take astronauts Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore to the ISS for a 10-day stay. We'll see if that stays on track. It's getting a bit crowded up there. The four astronauts from the private Axiom-3 mission are still on the International Space Station. They launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida on January 2nd. Undocking for that mission is scheduled currently for February 3rd. That means that right now there are 11 astronauts aboard the ISS, with an additional three Chinese Taikonauts aboard Tiangong, making a total of 14 people currently living in space. Speaking of the ISS, the private cargo ship Cygnus arrived at space station early on February 1st. It launched from Cape Canaveral on Tuesday, January 30th, so it had about 30 hours in flight before it docked. The spacecraft is carrying 8,000 pounds of equipment and supplies to the ISS. One of the interesting things on this mission, a metal 3D printer that will test 3D printing small metal parts in space. This is a project from the ESA, or European Space Agency. There's also been some discussion about the moon this week. Headlines about the moon's shrinking were a little bit exaggerated. Okay, to be clear, it is shrinking, but only about by 150 feet over hundreds of millions of years. The real news, though, is that the moon's changing surface because of this shrinking might lead to seismic instability in regions where NASA is looking to land astronauts for Artemis III and beyond. Basically, as the moon shrinks, it causes moonquakes, landslides, and more. Now, scientists have linked fault lines in the lunar South Pole region to the most powerful moonquake seismometers have ever recorded. This could be an issue for NASA's plans for Artemis III, currently scheduled for no earlier than September 2026, and beyond. For more on this, check out my video on our shrinking moon. It's been an exciting couple of weeks for Japan's moon lander, SLIM, or Smart Lander, for investigating the moon. It successfully made a precision soft landing on the lunar surface on January 20th, but in a suboptimal position. Its solar cells weren't receiving power. See my video on the landing for more information. The good news is the rovers were able to deploy. This is a photo of the SLIM lander face planted on the moon from its rover Lev 2. And JAXA did get a chance to download landing data from the spacecraft they confirmed that SLIM made a pinpoint landing within 55 meters of its landing site. The reason that the spacecraft didn't land in an optimal orientation for its solar panels is because about 50 meters above the lunar surface, one of its two engines was lost. SLIM was able to compensate for the loss of this engine in real time, but that's why the actual landing took place a little east of the original target site, because the spacecraft was a little off kilter because it was only using one engine. The velocity when SLIM landed was 1.4 meters per second, which is well within design specifications. That confirms that the spacecraft did soft land successfully. However, because the lateral velocity, or how fast it was moving horizontally across the moon's surface, and attitude were different than expected, the spacecraft settled with the solar cells facing west. JAXA shut down the lander with 12% battery in hopes it would wake up when the solar cells began to charge. Well, that happened this week and we got some images and more data from SLIM. 
That's the good news. The bad news is now night has fallen on the moon, so the cells can't charge anymore. Slim is once again shut down, and we're not sure if it will survive the two week long harsh lunar night. It was only designed to operate for one lunar day cycle, also two weeks long. So we just have to hope it makes it through the night. Those are the highlights for what happened in space news this week.